a lot of times when we look at the names of animals, we just kind of go, why? Why would you name them that? But in other cases, they're very apt. They're very appropriately named. And today's Species Spotlight is exactly one of those. Today I'm going to be talking about the Amazon Puffing Snake, sometimes called the Yellow Tree Snake or the Yellow Bird Snake or the Chicken Snake. Gotta love all the different fun names. Now, the Amazon Puffing Snake is a large, large, huge colubrid that hails from a good chunk of northern and parts of central South America. Now, when I say large, huge, that's, I mean it. They are some of the largest colubrids in the New World. So they're right up there with the indigos, the cribos, the muserranas, and the freshwater cobras, false water cobras. They can average seven to eight feet long. They can get over nine, and there are quite a few anecdotal tales of over 10 feet. These guys are huge snakes. Now, they belong to the genus Spilodes. A really famous member of Spilodes is the tiger rat snake. Both of these animals were recently highlighted in my advanced species list, and we'll talk a little bit about captive care at the end of the video. Now, the Amazon puffing snake gets its name for a pretty obvious reason, like we talked about. When it comes to snakes, every single one has different defense or threat displays. The first thing that almost every single snake wants to do, if they're ever threatened, wants to get out of there, get out of Dodge. But if they can't and they feel cornered, they have a bunch of different threat displays. Cobras will hood up, rattlesnakes will rattle, a lot of clubas will shake their tails, ball pythons turn into rocks. But the Amazon puffing snake basically looks like if you took a balloon and shoved it down their mouth and expanded it right at the back of their heads, it just super puffs up and they'll raise their bodies up and they'll poof up that really big part behind their throat where you can see the skin in between their scales to look large and intimidating. Really, really interesting, odd kind of species. Now, as one of their other common names, it's the yellow tree snake, a lot of times they are varying shades of yellow, but they are pretty variable. They can be different shades of yellow and brown. They can also be shades of red with different patches and highlights of black, bars of black, and a lot of the times they end up having a very dark, even to black tail. They almost kind of look like a really weird love child of a yellow tail and a black tailed Cribo mixed together with a really high yellow tiger rat snake. That's a really interesting species of snake. Now these guys are generally considered arboreal, but a lot of times they are found on the ground. They're usually more active during the day, as far as that we have noted and seen in both captivity and in the wild. And as far as food goes, they are kind of generalist, but like a lot of different species, they end up favoring some during the part where they're neonates to juveniles, and then as adults, they end up usually having larger amounts of other prey in their diets. So as juveniles, Amazon puffing snakes seem to favor eating a lot of essentially lizards and other species of snakes. As adults, they tend to start to be a little bit more generalistic, where they will still eat lizards and other snakes, including their own. They will also eat birds and small mammals. And in that, they have another really interesting trait, which I'm going to guess that some of you have already probably thought that I'm going to get to here now. And that is, unlike the other species in the genus Spilodes, the tiger rat snake, the Amazon puffing snake is actually rear fang venomous. We didn't think that for a very long time, despite the fact we've had them in captivity for a while, which is probably a good thing. That means they're fairly reluctant to bite, right? Or there aren't any really issues with them biting. So hooray, that's good. But they did a study a few years ago where they found that they were in fact rear fang venomous. And not only that, there's something kind of funky about their venom too. So a study that was done a couple years ago here in Colorado, the University of Northern Colorado, they actually found that their venom is prey specific. They have several unique toxins in there that affect different prey species more than the other. So when, we, when they broke it down, they saw that there were essentially two. The most common toxins out there as far as venom toxin proteins go, which was a solmotoxin, which is very deadly to mammals, specifically rodents, specifically rodents, and then soldetoxin, which is much more toxic to lizards and birds. And when they were doing this research, they found that even at incredibly high concentrations of solmatoxin, the deadly one to mammals, it wouldn't actually affect reptiles or birds at all. But incredibly high levels of soldetoxin didn't affect mammals at all. So it's a very interesting thing. And they think, or they theorize, that 
essentially evolutionarily speaking, they think that they first evolved in their rear fang venom capabilities, the soldi toxins, to affect lizards and birds, but as time progressed and mammals and their mammal, mammalian prey ugh, became more abundant, they think they started to develop those somatoxins to be able to start affecting those mammalian prey items more efficiently and effectively. Now, with all of that in mind, let's think about that animal in captivity. So in captivity, 99, if not 100%, there are some people working on breeding them out there. Um, they're going to be wild caught. So that means they're usually coming in as adults or larger individuals. All of the issues that we've talked about with wild caught snakes. And then when we think about this very large arboreal kind of wild caught snake, they're known to be quite reactive so we have to think about how we're going to take care of them in captivity. So a larger royal snake, we need a very large, a very tall enclosure with plenty of places for them to climb, as well as plenty of places for them to get away and hide. They are a reactive defensive species, so feeling very secure and being able to exhibit cryptic behavior and cryptic basking, which is just exposing parts of their bodies to, uh, to ultraviolet light and to thermal regulate, are all very, very important requirements when it comes to taking care of this animal in a very healthy way. I was researched when I was researching this, I saw that a lot of people actually hang uh, large cork tubes suspended either from vines or from anchors in their enclosure to allow them to actually be able to, in different areas and heights in their enclosure, actually rest inside their cork tubes as well as different hides on the ground. You want to make sure that it stays nice and humid. They are more diurnal species, so giving a nice full spectrum lining of UVA and UVB light is always a beneficial and a very good idea. Um, and then, you know, you always want to think about keeping them at relatively appropriate humidity and temperatures uh, when it comes to parts of the northern part of South America. Overall, they're a really beautiful and really interesting species of snake. And anecdotally, and as well as working with obviously this one that I used for all this video here, they seem to actually be much more amiable and more tolerant of handling and acclimate more to human interactions than tiger rat snakes or other larger or more arboreal species of snakes and colubrids. And as I mentioned previously, there's never been a recorded or known medically significant bite or envenomation of the Amazon puffing snake probably because they are more likely to run away and or pop up and actually uh, bite. Uh, there's other anecdotal stories that they will actually, in their puff of phase, will kind of do like the hog nose bluff bite where they'll just keep their mouth shut and just kind of hit you. And it's probably a much more threatening and uh, a better way of doing it than, say, a hog nose, considering, you know, hog nose, Amazon puffing snake. And that's longer than me. My wingspan's just over six feet, so even longer than what I have going on. But it, th with all that being said, it's an absolutely amazing species of snake. Hopefully you guys enjoyed today's video. It's always fun being able to talk about these kind of rare and unusual snakes that we don't get to see very often. Any questions, comments, concerns, let me know down below in the comments. Um, as always, please like and subscribe if you can. Hit that bell notification. You can check out my whole species spotlight playlist. There's well over 50 species on there. I am working my way through, through a lot of your different suggestions and doing a bunch of other really cool stuff. Again, thank you so much. Hope everyone's having a great day. I'll check you next time.